since I am I, I am calling from I am let's say logging in from Warsaw, Poland, so six hours ahead of you and six thousand miles away. In any case, um, I am delighted also as uh, as a former Montrealer for many many years. I have been living in your fair city, so. I'm delighted to uh, to be uh, with you. Now, I don't have much time and I don't want to bore you stiff with what I have to say, so I will keep the tr to to I will try to keep it simple and uh, and fairly entertaining. Uh, and then if you have questions, so uh, we can probe uh, further. And uh, so the uh, the reason I'm here with you today is that uh, Mm, Holocaust scholarship, Holocaust research, uh, Holocaust education uh, in a variety of uh, European states uh, found themselves uh, in a form of siege or under siege and uh, um, my own situation, um, I am working uh, and I am researching in Poland. I mean, I'm working in Canada. I'm teaching at University of Ottawa, uh, but my research um, is, uh, is linked to Poland. And Poland is a very specific and a special case because um, those of you who read a bit about the Holocaust uh, perhaps remember that, you know, out of the six million of the victims of the Holocaust, uh, uh, one half or three million were the Jews uh, or the Polish Jews and uh, the physical, the physical extermination, the, phys the death of, uh, of Jews of Europe occurred for the most part uh, on the uh, present Polish territory. Um, so it, um, it is uh, no surprise that the history of the Holocaust uh, plays a very special role in Polish history. Um, half of all the victims of the Holocaust, Polish Jews, and 75% uh, of them have been killed in sites which sound familiar perhaps to you, so, such as Auschwitz, Treblinka, Sobibur, Bełżec, uh, Majdanek, Helm. Kulmhof, you, you name them, the death uh, sites. In any case, um, in the past, you know, the uh, problems in teaching, researching uh, Holocaust history in, in Eastern and Central Europe were pronounced, but they were not as uh, serious as they have become recently uh, due to this uh, wave of uh, nationalistic, I would say, um, uh, a nationalistic takeover in politics. Uh, in Poland, this takeover happened in 2015, so it's fairly recent. Six years ago, uh, there was a party that came to power, extremely right-wing, and uh, um, these uh, people involved uh, are involved in something which we historians of the Holocaust call Holocaust distortion. Now, some of you uh, might be familiar with this expression Holocaust denial, okay? Holocaust deniers are people who said that, who say that uh, the whole Holocaust never happened, that, uh, that the Jews are basically inventing this story, that gas chambers never existed. So this is the, the pure old Holocaust denial. Now, this is a margin today. These uh, these are, let's say, very disturbed people who receive no, uh, let's say, audience. Nobody takes them seriously. However, this what became much more popular nowadays in especially in Poland, but also in the Ukraine, uh, in Hungary, Romania, in Lithuania, in a variety of uh, East and Central European countries, is something that, as I mentioned, we call Holocaust distortion. And it's much more insidious, much more dangerous kind of uh, lie. And uh, Holocaust distortion, and the they agree that Holocaust happened. They say, look, most unfortunate uh, six million Jews have been exterminated, but they would say that uh, our people had nothing to do with it. Okay, so the the way the um, Holocaust, the people engaging uh, or states and institutions engage in Holocaust distortion act is they do not deny the factuality of the Holocaust. They simply say, look, our people, our tribe, our nation had nothing to do with this. 
apples. Uh, if some, as in Poland, they will say, if some bad apples happen, uh, and in every society you have bad apples, then of course, uh, these people are criminals or fringe or margin, but by and large, the guilt is entirely with the Germans. Our people had nothing to do with this. Well, the, on the other side, they say that in Poland, they say uh, the distortionists, the people bent upon the distortion of the history, which is a form of Holocaust denial too. They will say that our people, our nation massively tried to help the Jews during the war, which is a blatant and, uh, and awful lie because historians have proved one, uh, one time and time and time again that uh, in reality, the Jews of Eastern Europe were dying pretty much alone. That uh, acts of help were extraordinary, beautiful and significant, but individual acts of individual, very brave and courageous people. So uh, here you have uh, simply a situation when a state, and it's important differentiation, it's not individuals, it's now the state that is engaged with its massive resources in rewriting the history of the Holocaust all over again. Now, they don't need history as we know it. They need a nice uh, uh, sort of a nice tale which somehow fits their idea of how to build up their national pride. They don't want actually to have a history of the Holocaust as we know it. They need something that, uh, that historians call today usable past, past which they can use, which they can, uh, let's say, adapt to their own needs. So in Poland, it became now a sort of an unofficial policy of the Polish state to stress strongly the Polish righteous, which were the people who helped the Jews, while basically glossing over or um, not mentioning at all people who, uh, who had a very, very uh, different, uh, very different attitudes, who took part in uh, German, uh, German, uh, German atrocities of, 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 uh, of uh, various kinds. And now here I would like to, um, I would like to show you a slide or two, uh, which will bring this message, so to say, in a more graphic, uh, graphic way to you. Um, so, um, there is, uh, let me see, there it goes. And uh, in order to enforce this, um, this uh, state narrative, this optimistic vision of the past, um, in Poland, uh, the authorities uh, created, funded, massively funded to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars per year, uh, institutions which are devoted to, let's say, enforcement of this, uh, of this uh, optimistic narrative. One of them is Institute of National Remembrance. There are other ones, Pilecki Institute. But how far this thing could go, um, I would like to show you on, a, um, on this example. Uh, the gentleman you see here raising his right arm in the Hitler greeting uh, is uh, one, of the, one of the former chiefs of this Institute of National Remembrance, one Dr. Tomasz Greniuk. Um, offering the Hitler greeting. The photo is 10 years of age, but just last, uh, 10 years old, but just last February, this fellow has been appointed a chief of one of the branches of this uh, institution, which the Polish state, uh, which the Polish state, um, uh, let's say, um, made a guardian of official uh, official, official uh, narrative. So this situation indeed is, uh, uh, is very, very, uh, very serious. And it strikes, um, it strikes the, the students of, uh, of the Holocaust in a variety of ways. Now, the thing is, some of you might have heard about the so-called Polish Holocaust law. Uh, this uh, Polish Holocaust law was enacted in Polish parliament uh, barely three years ago in January 2018. And uh, it was meant basically to penalize with three years in prison people who, uh, I quote, uh, who dared to suggest that Polish nation was complicit in the crimes of Nazi Germany, end quote. 
Uh, now, this, this, uh, this legislation, this uh, law created a huge outburst of, you know, fury around the world because, uh, well, governments and people woke up to the fact that here in Poland, the authorities want to try to change the way we, uh, we write about the history of, uh, of the Holocaust. So after some, after some, let's say, pressure, the Polish government changed its, changed its, its tune and said, OK, we are not going to put in prison these people. But what we are going to do is we are going to go after them on the way of the civil litigation. And here we are now. Um, uh, two years later, two and a half years later. And I would like to show you here a thick volume or two volumes, okay? These two volumes, and uh, I am a big man, but these volumes, believe me, are, are very large. Uh, each of them is about 800 pages, altogether, you know, 1700 pages, two of them. Uh, the title of this, of this book is uh, Night in Polish, but in English translation, it will be soon out, uh, hopefully this year still, it will be in English. I'm there from Yad Vashem and Indiana University Press. It's in Polish, it's called Dalej Jesnoc, which means uh, night without end. And it's about the fate of the Jews in uh, selected areas of occupied Poland. Now, I was the co-editor and co-author of this book. I brought together a group of eight, nine scholars. Uh, and uh, this was a painstakingly conducted research, years and years of hard work, and uh, thousands of footnotes. And this book landed on the bookshelves in Poland uh, uh, nearly exactly three years ago to the day, uh, in April of 2018. And it created a fury of the nationalistic authorities because what we did basically, we tried to convincingly, I would say, argue that the Polish society, there were people who were saving the Jews, but there were segments of the Polish society that did unspeakable cruelties toward the Jews. There were people who took advantage of the Jewish tragedy. There were people who robbed the Jews and there were very many people who denounced the, the Jews in hiding to the Germans and basically brought about their deaths. Uh, we even were able to prove that close to 70% of Jews who were went into hiding, who tried to survive, they were denounced or killed by their Polish neighbors. So all of this triggered an extraordinary, uh, one can say, a degree of hostility. Mm, just to show you, uh, just to show you a couple of uh, nice pictures, which will tell you the the level of, which will show you the level of uh, hostility that Holocaust researchers have to face uh, right now in, uh, in in my case in Poland. Let me share again the screen here with you. Um, uh, it's just you know here a few examples of um, of. Uh, um, let me just click forward here. Yeah, uh, if you look here, this is uh, this is a title page of uh, major pro-government weekly, uh, and on on the cover you can see the face of your truly lie without punishment goes the title on the title page. Well, if this is not enticement to violence, I can hardly uh, understand what can be. Uh, and uh, here you have. Uh, uh, a photo of myself uh, uh, on another uh, cover of this uh, weekly um, uh, with my colleague, pr Professor of Princeton in history, uh, Professor Jan Gross, uh, career in anti-Polonism. Here you have another one, the falsifiers of Polish history. Um, and here you have from Polish TV a screenshot. Uh, mm, it's uh, uh, it's about uh, uh, academics and their lies, uh, and it goes on and uh, and on and on. And so the problem is that there is here a fairly vicious campaign of hate coordinated by the state, conducted with the full knowledge of the uh, of the Polish state. And also, what happens is that scholars of the critical 
scholars, independent scholars of the Holocaust, are nowadays facing a court, facing a civil litigation. It's not criminal litigation, it is civil litigation, which doesn't sound all that serious as long as you don't know exactly what is the, um, the government strategy here. Um, it is history on trial. It's not um, one scholar like myself, like I or my colleagues, because we learned soon enough after the publication of the big book I showed you, uh, we learned fairly quickly that uh, that a lawsuit has been launched, civil one, against us by allegedly by a poor old widow who felt wronged that her long deceased uncle has been slandered, his name has been slandered in one paragraph of this of this 1,700 long page book. In reality, as we soon discovered, it was not the elderly widow uh, suing um, us. It was a fairly powerful and very well-funded NGO by the government uh, whose uh, job description, whose mandate was to basically um, uh, to make life as complicated for critical historians as uh, possible. Now, in their, in their lawsuit, uh, what they suggested was that uh, we wanted to malign and slander the good name of the Polish nation. That basically we wanted to harm the reputation of the nation and so on and so forth. Uh, the trial took a long, long time and uh, just recently, and this is one of the reasons I'm here sharing with you, uh, just recently there was, uh, there was a verdict, okay? We have been, um, I and my co-author and uh, co-editor, uh, we have been found partially guilty, partially guilty in a civil procedure. And it's not that I'm complaining, but the important part is that um, for Holocaust historians around the world, uh, this had a tremendous impact because this uh, justification in itself was striking at the heart of uh, what we as Holocaust historians do, what we can do, what we will be able to do in the future. So in other words, uh, the, the judge in Warsaw court decided in her wisdom that if a historian faces two sets of documents, two kinds of archival evidence which can contradict one another, which was actually the case here in the case of this uh, offending paragraph, that we cannot uh, make uh, our judgment, that we cannot formulate any hypothesis. The judge went further than that. She said that basically that, uh, that, the, if, uh, that historians have no right to determine which sources, which testimonies are more credible than other ones. Uh, we, uh, I, myself, my colleague, um, uh, oh, attach huge importance, importance to the testimony of Jewish survivors of the Holocaust. According to the judge of the Warsaw Court, we shouldn't. Uh, we should assign just exactly the same importance to various kind of, uh, kinds of evidence that are being placed or that we place on the, on the table. Furthermore, the judge decided that uh, looking at the whole situation, uh, she decided that uh, uh, that uh, um, historians who bring these kinds of evidence to the fore uh, can uh, can wound can hurt uh, feelings of national dignity of uh, Polish nation. Now this uh, verdict has been announced just uh, in a written version just one week ago, ten days ago. So it's very fresh. However, looking into the future, it should this kind of Holocaust distortion, because this is exactly what it is, should this uh, verdict uh, stand on appeal, because I and my lawyers uh, who work pro bono for me and my colleague, um, we will appeal, but should we lose on appeal, um, practically, it will mean an end of independent critical inquiry into the history of the Holocaust in Poland and probably in other countries of Eastern Europe, because these other governments are also keenly 
aware of this trial and they are probably going to apply the same road of civil litigation which can muzzle, which can stifle dissent, which can muzzle independent uh, historians. So this is a threat that we as historians of the Holocaust have to take very, very, very seriously. Uh, so in the future, what the, what the authorities, nationalistic authorities in Poland have already gained here or won half of more than half of the battle because it is not even uh, punishing um, uh, let's say uh, fairly well-known historians like myself or my colleagues but it's to instill atmosphere of fear a so-called chilling atmosphere now imagine you are students at Vanier so you still have some time but imagine that you are students of history um, on a graduate level in a university and then one day you have to make up your mind what kind of uh, uh, what kind of research topic you want to pursue do you think that uh, if you are uh, undergoing such a tremendous pressure and you will see that there will be no uh, no fellowship no work uh, no pat on the head no let's say career at the end of the day are you going to engage to embark upon any kind of critical inquiry into into history or are you going quietly to resign yourself to a less controversial topic so this kind of um, uh, this kind of problem this kind of uh, i would say extraordinary pressure is now a, um, a thing of, uh, uh, of extraordinary concern shared by, uh, by historians around the world. Actually, um, uh, just before I finish, I would like to tell you that uh, uh, during this trial and recently over the last few weeks, uh, I and my colleagues here in Poland, we have received extraordinary amount of support from Canadian Historical Association, from the American Historical Association, from the Israeli Historical Association, from various institution, uh, institutions around the world. I have, to be honest, never seen this intellectual community of scholars coming together under pressure in such a way. And uh, it demonstrated to me how clear and how present this danger is. And especially since we are dealing with the Holocaust, which has become, as you know, this universal benchmark, benchmark of evil, right? So if a government starts to, um, starts to fool around with the history of this, one of the greatest uh, catastrophes in human history, then they need to be warned that they do it at their own peril and that our reaction in a normal world outside, in this case of Poland, will be strong, that we will hold them to um, uh, responsible, responsible for, for what they do. Mm, and um, uh, and by the way, uh, when when the reason we are having this uh, this meeting today is that that the Holocaust has become this universal benchmark of evil, right? Even in our quaint dominion, Canada, we know what is Auschwitz. If I were to ask you about any other any other part of history of Poland and Holocaust is a very, very vital part of Polish history, you would probably have no questions for me because you wouldn't be able to mention one single date or individual um, from that history. But Auschwitz and Holocaust does ring a bell, and that's what makes it so, uh, so important. So I guess at this stage, I will, I will, um, I will conclude here, and uh, I wanting to leave some time for you to ask your questions, and I'll be more than delighted to uh, to to answer them if I if I if I have any answers so please thank you so much um, your talk was really excellent about just sort of giving a synopsis of what's going on in Poland and, and a very little microcosm <laughs> of twenty five minutes but um, I, I I did have I'm going to open up the question period please type in the question box if you have any questions, um, I guess um, I will I will lead it off if that's okay. Um, I guess the first one is more a question about because we have students here. What is there something a student who's listening to this who is um, feeling either shameful or angry or or whatever adjective you want to put in and and feel like they want to do something to help? What is it that they can do? Well, the well, it's actually it's a, it's actually a difficult question because at this stage there, I mean, one thing is that you have, if you, for instance, if you have 
if you uh, if you are uh, in touch with let's say the officials of the polish state or polish embassy or anything like this in canada you can send them a letter stating that you know you are aware of this distortion that's going on and that you protested and that might you know not that they will be very preoccupied they will probably will throw it out uh, throw it out to garbage as soon as they get it but but it's important if you make your point your knowledge or your protest known and another thing is that there will be in pub and there is already in public space a number of letters of protestation and letters of support well, sign them if you you already know something about the situation, um, and the scholars under siege will need your uh, your moral support uh, in the coming uh, weeks and months and years uh, more than ever. And the scholars of the Holocaust, uh, they might be considered in Eastern Europe a sort of an endangered species. So, if you like endangered species, then you could you could join. You know the voice protest and trying to keep it light but it's actually it's actually a problem so at this stage there is not much more that can be done but um, but if you have an exchange you know with uh, with your mp you can also mention that th this is something that you find very troubling and perhaps they can raise it higher up up, up the feeding feeding chain so to say my second question is is on a personal nature while you're in in poland do you ever fear fear your own physical safety given that you've been on, you know, magazine covers, newspaper covers, and so on. Well, you know, especially you know, with with, with you, when you have when the 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 the, the public media, the TV, uh, they have plastered my face on a number of occasions uh, with the subtitle "Falsifier of History" and so on and so forth. It's not nice. It's 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 um, it's. I would say you know, in our profession, we know that words acquire their own meaning, and that words quickly, at a certain point, are transformed into action. Uh, so uh, you know, but uh, hopefully uh, or unfortunately, we are living in a pandemic. I'm wearing my mask on my face here in Warsaw, which, which helps to uh, keep things more anonymous. But, but indeed, I was, let's say, confronted a number of occasions before, uh, and, uh, and it's, uh, it's not uh, pleasant. On the other hand, uh, you know, it unfortunately comes with the territory. So, uh, so, so, um, so this level of, because the other thing is that what happened in Poland now happens here all the time is, it's not only, of course, scholars of the Holocaust, it's a part of a larger battle of destruction of democracy here. Um, uh, you have a wave of authoritarian rule and this, um, this uh, sort of expedition against history is one part of the assault on democracy. Uh, on the other hand, what you see here in Poland will be a ruthless, war waged on LGBT community. Uh, you can ask why they do it. Well, they do it because they need an enemy, okay? And nothing consolidates your electorate more and better than a common enemy. So it, in the past, it could be Jews, but there are 3,000 Jews in a 38 million uh, strong society. So how much can you build on, the, on this? But there are refugees from the South that you can exploit in this way. And now it's LGBT community. So you can have a package you know, of uh, hateful statements, package of hate, which unfortunately uh, works if in, many, in many cases. Are there any questions from, from, uh, from the viewers? I'm gonna give you a, a minute or so. Um, Okay, we have one question here. Um, so we have somebody who's anonymous asking what the name of the book was. Okay, the book is uh, the book here that I showed you is called The Night Without End. Um, it's called The Fates of the Jews in Selected Counties of Occupied Poland. So the book, as I mentioned, two volumes and Night Without End, and it's now in print and should be available in English. I don't have precise date of publication, but I hope it will be, you know, within a few months. Okay, so um, I would like to thank you, Jan, for coming and for speaking and for taking time. Um, oh, wait, we have one more question. Sorry, I'm just gonna go. Um, so somebody wrote for the general public, where can we find the letter uh, to the government to sign. 
I will send. I will send Marlene. I will send you an, an email with the with this with this link. So then you all can you can you can you can uh, you can relay it to your students. I'm certain. You Absolutely. And that, oh, we have lots of questions coming in now. <laughs> so I'm not going to say goodbye quite yet. <laughs> Sorry. Um, another question: Where and how can we educate educate ourselves more on this topic? You know what? Uh, it's actually if you. Um, if once again I can send I can send Marlene a couple if if you Google my name and I mean you shouldn't perhaps Google my name because you will have a lot of nationalistic also nonsense attached to it I mean the things that are going on on Wikipedia with my entry are absolutely unbelievable it's uh, I was told it's being changed up to thirty times per day uh, by people who are not exactly thrilled with what I do uh, but if you if you if you look up uh, you know uh, my you know, I trial Jan Grabowski Holocaust probably you will get more than your fill of information and if you look for it for decent uh, sources of information such as the guardian or new york times or things like this you are you can be reasonably certain that you will have a at least a fairly good overview of the situation um another question and by the way i will forward uh it, the links to i have all everybody's email so i will forward absolutely any information that uh, that you have does forward. Um, so another question: What sort of distortion have you encountered in Canada? What sort of distortion I found in Canada? Actually, uh, in, in our it, it depends when you, it depends when you uh, look at this period at what period of time. For instance, I remember when I was a student, I was a PhD student at Université de Montréal in late 1980s, so you know thousands of years ago. Uh, and um, uh, at the time, at the time, I was actually a historian of 18th century Canadian history of uh, New France and Nouvelle France, and so doing something very different than I did today. But uh, by, by, back then uh, in Quebec, uh, there was a very strong, I would say, you could call it distortion. Uh, it was uh, an attempt to present uh, Canadian history, colonial history, as the one rosy period of cooperation between, you know, newcomers and natives, between the Aboriginal population and the French Canadian population which uh, now we know today it was not exactly true. So uh, there was a different kind of distortion which has in time has been overcome. Um, uh, there was, uh, there are more subtle attempts, but by and large, by and large in democratic societies, you don't get state controlled, uh, state enforced uh, uh, distortion in a way that you will find in uh, authoritarian states such as now Poland or Hungary or Russia or Turkey. Uh, in Turkey, people are in prison. In Russia, people, historians are in prison for, for saying, basically writing the truth. So usually if you have democratic societies open and somehow willing to confront their past, you don't get this kind of distortion. Um, are there any other questions? Oh, okay, sorry, one more question. Have you seen any similarities between distortion of the Holocaust and distortion of residential school history? Well, definitely, I did in the 1980s when I when I when I came to this when I was in the middle of these discussions regarding the, that was when Jim Miller published his first book, Large on Residential Schools, and there was a lot of denial and there was a lot of protestations. And uh, but once again, I believe that it, but by the turn of century, uh, these debates uh, sort of turned mainstream, and I don't think that anyone responsible in today in Canada would deny the 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 the, the horrible things that happened in residential schools it became also a part of what's being taught now in 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 secondary schools if i am not wrong but mind you i'm not an expert here uh, but i believe that it was a very painful discussion which started with a lot of started with a lot of people re rejecting this idea of uh, factuality of what has happened and nowadays i would say that the canadian society reconciled itself with the with the with the painful historical past um, is, is the majority of Polish people unaware of the truth? Uh, no, I would say that uh, that unfortunately uh, they are rejecting. Majority rejects the truth. It's uh, unfortunately in the Eastern European countries, history very often is being taken rather as a religion, not as science or as uh, academic pursuit. It is a set of beliefs. Okay, and if um, if you if you hear something that strikes at the heart of your religion, you sort of evacuate it from your mind. So it's not the question 
question of absence of information, of lack of access to information. It's rather the closing of one's mind. And this is something that uh, we all here have to deal with and uh, fight against. So it's, it's an uphill struggle because if you have the state and school system and so on aligned against you, then of course it makes the situation much more complicated. Um, another, another question. Do you see a link in the rewriting of the Holocaust and the new abortion restrictive laws? Interesting question. It's actually, yes, I would say that there is a package, okay? There is a package of beliefs which go somehow together. Between Poland now, there is a huge wave of official sponsored and church support, Roman Catholic church supported campaign uh, to basically make abortion completely illegal. I mean, in Poland, abortion is practically illegal, but uh, for instance, in the cases of rape, uh, it is still possible to have an abortion. Now they want to do exactly away with that particular thing. And when you look at the people who are involved uh, in these campaigns against, let's say, critical history and in favor of absolute uh, lack of abortion, these circles overlap largely. Now, why is it so? It's a, probably a longer period of the discussion, which I don't think we can embark upon today. But it's, a, it's, a, it's quite symptomatic. And thank you for that question. It's, it's I would say, largely yes. Um, when the government makes up a new perspective, when, when, when they create their own narrative, um, how, how do they justify the factual proof, um, such as government participation in photos? How is that justified? Well, what they do is uh, this distortion is not that they, they don't lie, actually. What they do is they put entire stress on just one part of history and they present this part as the full spectrum. So to give an example, what they will do is they, if you look at, let's say, any kind of English language pages of Polish Ministry of Foreign Affairs, you, you, can, you can Google them and you will see you will you will see all over the place mentions of uh, Polish righteous, of Poles who were saving the Jews under the occupation. Now, there is no problem. There were people who were saving the Jews, actually. There were very many Poles who did it. However, what they will never tell you is that they, these people were a tiny and deadly frightened minority, and that these people, the Poles who were saving the Jews, were not so much preoccupied with the Germans, they were most preoccupied with their own Polish neighbors who were very likely to denounce them to the Germans, okay? So the deadly threat was not coming from the Germans, it was coming from your own neighbors for whom hiding the Jews was not something you would condone. So this is a kind of, so what they do is they present present a small spectrum of the of the of the past and they present it as a uh, as a historical truth uh, representing the entire uh, image scenery so this is uh, this is this is in a, in a, in a little let's say uh, in the shape and form of the holocaust distortion um, what is it about the holocaust that appeals to people who buy into conspiracy theories well, this is, uh, I mean, it, it goes beyond the Holocaust, uh, it, beyond the Holocaust history. It can be about vaccination, right? It can go, uh, our minds, and this is once again, not a question for a historian, rather for a psychologist, but our minds are open to this kind of easy explanation. Easy explanation mean, means that there are mysterious forces, okay, at play, which we don't entirely understand, but we, think that they really act behind them. It can be the Jewish, let's say, conspiracy to rule the world. For hundreds of years, people believed in this kind of thing. Or it can be that you have a powerful corporation that wants to poison your water, or that wants to poison you with the vaccination for their own uh, purposes. This unfortunately conspiratorial set of mind is something that sways uh, a significant percentage of people. And so you will have people who don't believe in the factuality of the Holocaust, who think that the Jews are using it to create sympathy for themselves in the world, or who will think that the vaccination will, will you know, make you a zombie, or that the trails behind the jet, the jet liners in the sky are a form of population control. I mean, there are so many of these, uh, of these strange ideas, but they fill some kind of need. And unfortunately, we just have to take it with a big grain of salt, understanding that many people are suspect, has, well, are likely to respond well to this kind of, uh, of idiocy. 
Um, what does Holocaust education look like in Polish schools? And has the approach changed with the passing of the new law? Well, you know, I can't tell you much because uh, I was in the past uh, still seven, eight years ago, I was able to work with Polish teachers uh, to teach them basically to give them uh, instruction. And uh, now it has been made impossible, of course. Uh, what uh, I don't even want to start to tell you what the Holocaust education in Poland looks like because it's a sad story. Uh, but this is basically uh, what they are pushing in schools is this happy a happy story of uh, Polish society saving uh, saving the Jews. And the results actually are pretty depressing. I will show you, perhaps I will share a screen for a moment still here. I will show you um, uh, uh, one, more, uh, one more slide. Uh, this is something that really sort of uh, makes, you, uh, makes you wonder. Um, if you look at this, uh, not this thing, now where are we? It's not here. I'm trying to find uh, the right thing. No, this is not this one. Well, let me see if I can, no, it's not so easy. Well, the thing is I wanted to show you a graph, but I wasn't able to. And um, there is a graph, uh, a recent poll, which found that uh, uh, the question was, uh, do you think that uh, that historians writing about Polish complicity in the Holocaust should be put in prison? And 40% uh, responded that they agree strongly or somewhat 10% were not sure. Now, the question was not historians who uh, who tell lies about Polish complicity. It was historians who write about Polish complicity. In other words, you have 40% of people today in Poland who would put in prison innocent people who dare to confront the, the past. Uh, so this is, this is very, I would say, uh, very uh, sad uh, and a very, very troubling, uh, let's say, conclusion of a long process of indoctrination which happened over time. Thank you so much for answering all the questions. Thank you, audience, for posing a lot of great questions. Um, um, we have an audience member saying thank you as well. Um, thank you for spending your time with us. Thank you for informing us. Um, and, it's, my, and, it's my pleasure, and thank you for this invitation. And uh, je vous souhaite une excellente journée. I wish you a wonderful day. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, thank you for the invitation and off I go. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.